And now we take you to London, England, where acclaimed British intellectual Norena Hutt is standing by for her live radio broadcast. Mega Hutt, London Calling. Opinions and conversations from a British point of view about Europe, America, and everything British. This is not your father's BBC. No stiff upper lip, no keep calm and carry on, no tea and crumpets or tally ho. It's opinions and fresh perspectives from politics to pop culture and everything in between. It's honest, fun, raw, and unfiltered. Live from London, this is Megahertz London Calling with your host, Norena Hertz. Good day, America, and welcome to Megahertz, the show that crosses oceans to bring you the best and brightest of thinkers and doers from Europe the United Kingdom and beyond. Today, we venture into worlds that are externally familiar to all of us, but whose secrets are little known. What really goes on in the teenage brain? Sarah Jane Blakemore, one of the world's leading neuroscientists, a professor who has revolutionized how we understand adolescence, will reveal all. What do Israelis think of Trump? Unique Levy, Israel's most foremost primetime news anchor, a trailblazing journalist who has interviewed not one, but three US presidents will give us the lowdown. And never mind the drones, how does it feel to work for today's mega corporations at the bottom end of the scale? Writer, journalist and political commentator James Bloodworth can answer that. He has just spent six months undercover at Amazon and Uber. Welcome all. Now, Lent is just over. And for many people, Lent is a time of giving something up. I gave up sugar last year. It was actually my New Year's resolution for 2017. And I've stuck to it since. I mean, it was really hard. It was kind of like coming off a Class A drug, I imagine. Um, I had a slight relapse this weekend. I did have a very raw chocolate, orange and goji bar. But is there something you've recently given up or are trying to give up, James? Um, I've been fighting a kind of running battle for 10 years with cigarettes that I've, I'm on top of at the moment, but there's always the chance of relapse. It can come at any moment, <laughs> um, whether it's from um, a night when too many drinks are consumed or a particularly stressful day. So I'm, I'm fighting that battle once again uh, this Easter, as I fought it last Easter and the Easter before that. Because I, I was a smoker and I smoked, and I was a really bad smoker in my teens actually. And when I gave up, I knew that if I were to ever have one cigarette, that would be it. I'd just be back there. So. I mean, I, I give myself liberty if, again, if it's been a heavy night or something, I'll give myself the liberty, liberty to have one. And then, as you say, I'll be back on the kind of slippery slope to, to having another one. Sarah Jane? I very rarely give anything up, but it just so happened in the last month over Lent, but that's a complete coincidence, that I seem to have given up milk. Um, but that's nothing to do with being dairy intolerant or anything like that. It's just because a friend of mine introduced me to oat milk, and I'm a complete convert. And now I, I feel like I'm someone who's given up milk. <laughs> I, 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 I do almond milk. Yeah, almond um, milk. I'm a it's good too, but oat milk, try it. Okay, I will try <laughs> oat milk. You're neat. How about you? I am uh, giving up, giving up things. That is my <laughs> that is my Lent resolution. Yeah, I figured out. I, I was my epiphany. It's like a chocolate flavor flavor epiphany. I read this article in the New York Times, and the headline was, "Adults can have chocolate for breakfast too." And they sort of explain how you can have. I don't know. Uh, some sort of teaspoon of, of unsweetened cocoa with your porridge and then I was like wait adults can have chocolate anytime because they're adults and no one is telling them what to do so I'm I'm for chocolate and I am not giving up that okay all right well um you know to change tack I have been so inspired of late by the vast swathe of American teenagers who've risen up to protest <coughs> against US gun laws. I mean, these Parkland teens and their contemporaries are truly remarkable, but inspiring and remarkable are not usually the words that come to mind when one's describing teens. More typical descriptors would be moody, lethargic, unfathomable, risk-taking, which I think was a pretty fair description of me at that age. <laughs> but why are teens so different? Difficult. What makes them so different to adults and what does understanding these differences imply for how we should treat them? I couldn't have a better person to ask all of this than Sarah Jane Blakemore. Sarah Jane is Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience at University College London 
and a multi-award-winning researcher and author. World-renowned for being at the forefront of research into teenagers' brains, she has just published Inventing Ourselves, The Secret Life of the Teenage Brain. Sarah Jane, I absolutely loved your book and there's so much to discuss. And one thing I found really fascinating was that it's not just humans that exhibit these typical teenage traits, is it? But so do adolescent animals. Yeah, that's right. Um, ad adolescence is something that all species go through. So it's not just something that humans go through. It's a period of life between puberty and becoming fully sexually mature adults that you can see across species. And lots of labs around the world study adolescence in different animals, um, in particular mice and rats. So mice and rats both go through about 30 days of adolescence between oh, going, through, yeah, <laughs> going through puberty <laughs> and becoming adults. There's about 30 days and you can measure their behaviour in those 30 days. And what has been found is that uh, both uh, rats and mice and other species of, of mammals um, uh, show increased risk taking, uh, increased exploration of their environments, increased socialization during that period of adolescence. There was a study published a couple of years ago showing that uh, adolescent mice <coughs> drink more alcohol when, with, when they're with other mice, and that's not <laughs> true for adult mice. So if you, if you put adolescent mice <laughs> with cage mates, that makes them drink more alcohol, whereas cage mates or alone doesn't affect how much alcohol adult mice drink. So there's some parallels between this ki these kind of stereotypical behaviours that we, we, we tend to associate with this age group mm -hmm. that you can see across species. Rats, like slam the cage door and don't want to talk with their mother <laughs> and yell at them and things like that. I mean, that's <laughs> but it's, no, it's not all about hormones, is it? Because that's what I learned from your book. There's something actually different going on in teenagers brains is that right yeah so when i was at um when i was an undergraduate about 25 years ago i was taught that the human brain stops developing in childhood and all the typical behaviors that we associate with adolescents like being moody and taking risks and being influenced by peers that kind of thing uh was put down to ch to big hormonal changes at puberty but we now know that um, because we have, we now have the ability to scan the living human brain at all ages to track changes in brain structure and brain function across the lifespan. We now know that the idea that the human brain stops developing in childhood is completely false. And in fact, the brain continues to develop right throughout childhood, of course, and throughout adolescence and even into the 20s and 30s. And that brain development probably contributes a lot to the changes in behaviour we see during this period of life. Because when you're scanning the brains, do you see, do you see <coughs> something different in teenager brains versus adult brains? A lot is different in a teenage brain and an adult brain, both in terms of the structure of the brain, so what it looks like, how it's composed, how much grey matter and white matter it contains, but also how, how uh, activity is produced in the brain. So for example, when you're, you can put someone in a brain scanner, an MRI scanner, and measure how their brain becomes active when they do something, like, I don't know, when they look at photographs or listen to music or when they take risks. And you can see different levels of activity in different parts of the brain changing as people go from being an adolescent to an adult. And is it right that the part of the brain that regulates emotional responses and inhibits risk-taking is different in teenagers? Yeah, so lots of the brain actually is different in teenagers and adults. One of the regions that differs most and undergoes the most substantial and protracted development is called the prefrontal cortex, which is right at the front of your head, just behind your forehead. Um, and this is the brain region involved in all sorts of high level cognitive processes like decision making and planning, like planning what you're going to do tonight or next week or next year. It's also uh, involved in self-awareness and understanding other people and empathy and also in inhibiting inappropriate responses, including stopping yourself taking risks. And we see that this brain region is developing very, very gradually and very substantially. It changes a huge amount during the teenage years and it doesn't really become, it starts levelling off in, in the mid-twenties or thirties. So does that help explain why, why teenagers act differently? Partly. Um, there's a theory that, uh, that, that is um, uh, that has been proposed by several different cognitive neuroscientists around the world that um, it's the combination of this slow 
protracted substantial development of prefrontal cortex at the same time as um, hypersensitivity of the brain's reward system. So the brain's reward system is the part of the brain like the nucleus accumbens uh, that gives you a kick out of, for example, taking risks. It makes you feel good. And we know that, that those parts of the brain that are involved in reward processing, firstly, uh, mature a bit earlier in development than the prefrontal cortex and are also hypersensitive to reward. So they are overactive to when an adolescent gets a reward from risk taking compared with yep. when an so adult So it feels does. particularly good. That's the idea. I mean, yeah. actually, one thing to say now is that these are brain imaging studies I've been talking about. And one thing that is tempting to do is to try to conclude uh, something about the psychological process, what an adolescent is feeling from which part of their brain is active. In fact, we can't make that kind of link. We don't know, um, you know, a reward area being hyperactive. We don't know that that absolutely means that that person is feeling more rewarded. That's just a kind of assumption that we make, but actually it's a, probably a, ba a bad assumption. It's, it, it's a, an assumption too far. What about the environment in which a teen grows up in, because presumably that has an impact on how they evolve. I mean, I've, I've been doing a lot of research myself on teenagers, and one of the things that I argue, and now I'm going to have the neuroscientist tell me perhaps that this is all wrong, but what I argue is that teenagers today are really facing these three very different forces. Um, technology, that they're being exposed to much more technology than they ever were, permanently connected, always social, always on, um, but also this world of greater existential threat or perceived existential threat that they're living in. So this world of bombings and attacks that they see 24-7 on their smartphones and that this generation, today's teenagers, came of age during the Great Depression, the, dep the recession of, the, um, of 2008. And I kind of feel that it's those three forces combined that seem to be really shaping this generation, including perhaps um, being the reason for the current mental health crisis amongst this generation. Does, does that make sense, this sort of interpretation? It's nice, I mean, it's an interesting um, explanation, and I think all those things, you know, there'll be a lot of nodding, I, I reckon, people hearing you say that, everyone will resonate with that and think, yeah, life has really changed, it's really hard now with the technologies that we didn't have when we were teenagers, like mobile phones in our back pockets and social media, and uh, yeah, pressures like the recession. But I mean, you could probably apply something similar to all generations of teenagers. You could probably pick out very stressful things in the environment that affected all genera generations of teenagers throughout history. Um, and the, the, I think the, the, there are two things to say. Firstly, absolutely the environment affects brain development and it affects the development of teenagers. So that's, that's for sure. We know, we know that from lots of different studies. Um, how it affects the teenage brain, we know a lot less about. So, for example, people, uh, there's a lot of kind of fear about social media and the effect that that's having on, on the developing brain. And actually, we really know very little about that. We just don't know. And yes, uh, we in this country have seen an increase in mental health problems in young people over the last 10, 20 years. Mm. And it's the same, I've seen kind of global studies. I think so, yeah. Yes. And, w and again, whether that's an increase in reporting, a reduction in stigma, or real increase in incidence. We don't really know. Um, most of the child psychologists and psychiatrists I work with feel it's a bit of both. It's a bit of um, increased awareness, but also there, there, is, there has been an underlying increase in incidence. Okay, and there's been obviously an increase in all this technology, but that's just a correlation. And all the studies that have been done so far looking at s purported links between social media, mobile phones, and mental health problems are just reporting correlations. And we don't know whether that's where the one thing causes the other. It could be something completely separate that we're missing. Yes. By, for example, I mean, one... Well, one for example, the fact they came of age during the recession or the fact that they're exposed to these kind of terror attacks and bombings on a regular basis. So it could be all of it. It could be or something completely different. Mm. Like, for example, I think working with lots of teachers and schools, at least in London, that work pressure, education pressure has increased since I was at school. Now it's a pretty academically pressurised school, but compared with now, um, yeah, the pressure was less 30 years ago when I was at school. Um, and that, that 
is something that's very, it's very actually strangely very rarely talked about it, with all these different theories as to why <laughs> we've seen this increase in mental health problems in adolescents. School stress isn't one of the things that floats to the top. The, the um, yeah, mobile phones is one. <laughs> yeah, interesting. And more generally, how do our teenage years then shape us as adults? Because your book is called Inventing Ourselves. So uh, is this teenage period, is that what shapes us later on? If you think back about what it was like to be a teenager, just remember, you know, it's, it's quite easy for, for most of us to remember our teenage years to a certain extent. That's a kind of interesting phenomenon that most people's memories, um, if, they, if they think back about their memories, the memories that are most vivid are the memories of our teenage years and our early 20s. It's something that psychologists called the reminiscence bump where we're particularly good at remembering things that went on in our teens and 20s. So if you think back about your teens, what changes in your teens? Uh, one thing that changes really dramatically is your sense of self, your self-identity, and particularly your social self. So that is how other people see you, who you are within your peer group, within your community. Um, and I think that's what adolescence is all about. It's about self as an independent adult. It takes many years to get there. And one of the consequences of that is that you invent yourself. You, you, there's a step change in importance mm. that you apply to things like, you know, your music taste. Your yes, I, I, rem I remember going on <laughs> holiday with a boyfriend and lugging with me the complete works of Nietzsche. Oh, God, um, yeah. Because I wanted to seem very cool. <laughs> exactly. Like, back to the beach. You know, I know. What, what were you we like? Did, did you that. do that? Oh, no, hopefully <laughs> not, because it was a very heavy volume. Still do that. <laughs> you still do that. War and Peace was like <laughs> prominent on my book. I don't think I've ever read it. <laughs> <laughs> you need, what were you like? Um, how, do you feel you were shaped I'm, by your teen oh experience? I'm trying to bring back the files I deleted now, because Sarah said <laughs> the, 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 these are the things that you must remember. I'm like trying to erase like my teenage years. I guess. Um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm listening to, to, to Sarah's analysis on this and I'm, I'm just thinking that if someone, the amazing thing is about our teenage years is that if, if we had known that, that everyone was like us, suffering, you know, feeling terrible, looking at themselves in the mirror, thinking we're ugly, which is what I felt completely for like five years, um, that everyone is going through this, this pain and this torture and this, you know, obviously inventing ourselves and becoming who we will be. Uh, when we are growing up is, 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 is a painful process, um, at least it was for me. And I'm just thinking that if, if someone could just you know, find me there and say, it's going to be OK, <laughs> um, I would probably be better off. And since the uh, best series I've ever, saw, you know, ever seen on television about being a teenager is Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Noreen, I've been trying to get you to watch that for like five, a long time. Yeah, for like five years, um, it's and true. You know, obviously, high school is hell is quite realistic because they were living on a hell mouth, so it is hell. Um, but I think that, that 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 is an example of what happens when you sort of hear the voices and know that everyone like you is in, in terrible pain. That was just my way of not answering directly to what <laughs> how I but suffered. No, no, I got a little bit. I got a little bit. It was tough. I think is the, <laughs> I, think, I think it's the bottom line. Yeah, and I think well, what's interesting about that is that it's it's in addition to knowing that other people are going through it, which I think is right. A lot of teenagers are going through the same kind of feelings and turmoil. Um, it's also understanding that that is there and happening for a biological reason mm. um, and it, that it will settle down and it's part of this adaptive process that we all need to go through. And I didn't know that when I was a teenager. No, I wish you could have told me that when I was 15. I mean, yeah, it would be useful. Yes, yes very much. <laughs> the, the memory thing, the point you say about it's easy to, easier to remember your teenage years because you're forming an identity then which <laughs> to some extent I suppose sticks with you for the rest of your life. But is it also... I mean, I remember being a teenager, there was a, there was a real potency to the emotions you're feeling, whether that's an exhilarating potency or something awful, but you almost, the highs and lows are much, much uh, steeper than they are perhaps when you get older. Is that also why you remember it, do you think, um, in that the emotional response feels so strong when you remember that feeling back then, but then when you get older, it's kind of, you, you're more in control, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, there is quite a lot of evidence that teenagers feel things more deeply than other age groups and that's definitely one explanation of the reminiscence bump mm. another is that we are doing things for the very first time so you're you know they're novel and you, rem you remember the novelty but there are I mean this is actually a phenomenon that we don't really know why we remember um, things things more strongly from our teenage years and one possibility is that you encode memories differently then as part of a biological developmental process again we don't know we don't <laughs> have any data on that this is wow. an interesting idea I mean we could just go on and on asking about 
all of this, but unfortunately we don't have more time to drill into it. But thank you so much, Sarah Jane. Um, your book, Inventing Ourselves, The Secret Life of the Teenage Brain, is just out. And we all wish that we'd had it when we were teenagers. Mm. <laughs> now, we've all seen the photographs. A warehouse like a vision of consumer infinity. A kind of giant circuit board stacked with every imaginable product. A maze of shelves and walkways with no visible beginning or end. And somewhere in the frame, tiny human figures pushing trolleys, always against the clock, always under pressure, continually monitored, and never, you can be sure, well paid. But what is it really like to work for these giants? Journalist James Bloodworth decided to find out. James is a celebrated columnist and author whose previous book blew the lid open on the myth of meritocracy and who now is opening the world's eyes to the reality behind fast and easy consumerism. In his new book, Hired, Six Months Undercover in Low-Wage Britain, he describes his experiences working undercover in various low-income jobs, including inside an Amazon warehouse and as an Uber driver. So James, this is very much in the tradition, really, of you know, big undercover journalists, whether it's George Orwell, of course, Dan and out in Paris and London, or a bit that I love that came out about 15 years ago, Barbara Erin Rice, Nickel and Dime. Yeah, did you love that too? I, I really recommend that to everyone. Um, what was it like going undercover? Um, so yeah, first of all, I mean, that I did take inspiration from some of those uh, journalists who'd been, been done this kind of thing before. So I mean, George Orwell's the most famous um, example. Um, his, the person who came before him was Jack London, who inspired him um, to do Down That in Paris and London. More recently, Barbara Ironreich, um, Nickled and Dime, that was, um, that was a really interesting book. Polly Toynbee um, did a similar book in, I think, 2004 in this country. Um, so there was kind of, it felt like there had been um, a while since someone had done one of those types of books. And I was more of an, I, I leaned more towards investigative journalism anyway. Um, so going undercover, um, at some of the at some of these firms, which I felt were doing things that, that a lot of people didn't know about but should know about, I thought that would be a really good, um, well, a really a really appropriate appropriate topic to cover. Is it uh, like some of people were struggling. Actor. Um, there were times. I mean, during job interviews, it was there was a there was an aspect of acting to the process. Um, so that was probably the most uncomfortable in some ways. The uh, adopting a persona. Um, which wasn't, which isn't really me, but it's. But then it was for. The, it genuinely was for the greater good. So, when I was interviewed by people at Amazon, who Transline, the agency, uh, who employed me for Amazon, um, and immediately there were kind of. You could see how they were treating people, and um, it wasn't that hard to put on this act because it was for the for to the greater good to expose some of the these work practices. Can Can you talk me through? Talk us through what a typical shift was like at the Amazon warehouse. Okay, so, I mean, first of all, I suppose I'd, I'd want to talk about the atmosphere um, when you first arrive at the warehouse. So it had the atmosphere of what I imagine a prison uh, would feel like in that you have to, first of all, go through giant airport-style airport security scanners um, to enter the warehouse, um, and also when you leave um, to go to the toilet or to take a break. Um, so you clock on, say, um, you have a card you clock on. Why do you have to be scanned just when you go to the toilet? Um, in case you've, you're mean, stealing something oh, and hiding it in the in the bathroom right. or something. Um, it's, it's a, it's, there's a hyper paranoid uh, atmosphere to it. You know, you clock in. If you clock in one minute late, you lose 15 minutes of pay. There are kind of things you have to be looking out for all the time. If you arrive at your desk, your, your pick desk where you collect this, um, you're basically your rotor for the day. Um, if you're, you know, if you're late there at all, you get... A, you get uh, another reprimand, um, and then you walk 10, mi 10 to 15 miles a day picking items off the shelf for Amazon's customers. Um, constantly kind of monitored by this handheld device you carry around with you, which directs your movements, um, tells you, admonishes you to speed up. Um, it, it tells you to speed up? Yeah, so you get mess this, this vibrating device you carry around with you. It, it, you have, there's this timer bar, so like uh, imagine an egg timer like tips upside down, there's this countdown timer as soon as you pick it up and you have to collect items before it runs down the timer and as soon as you collect one item the new time the timer switches over so it starts again and, and if, if you're and sometimes you get um, messages through it vibrates and it's a message saying you need to get your your productivity up 
Um, which means walk faster. Yeah, walk faster. Or you, I mean, there was a prohibition on running in the warehouse, but in order not to get fired, you had to run. So it's a bit like a dystopia in that there were rules that you couldn't avoid breaking if you wanted to keep your head above water. Um, there were lots of things like that. It's very it was impossible to. It was impossible to be good, um, is I think. George Orwell writes somewhere in 1984, it was impossible to be good. Um, is, is, is it like that, but on a smaller, smaller scale? And you're, you know, you're a fit, Thanks. you look like you're in good <laughs> shape kind of guy. Um, so even for someone like you, was it hard to, were you getting some of those reprimands? Yes, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I go to the gym, um, I'm relatively fit and healthy. <clears throat> and the first week I was working there, I, I came in the bottom 10% in, I was informed by um, an Amazon number of staff that I'd come in the bottom 10% in terms of productivity. Um, so if you're kind of, if you're, if you're older, if you're um, overweight, if you're, you're unfit, then the job was, was, was nearly impossible. And I mean, if you think, I think the, there's an important context of this in that Amazon was the biggest employer in this town um, where I was living at, at the time f um, for this job. And this was a town where if you go back 30 years, they had, you know, two power stations. There were, there was a, uh, a colliery there. There were, there was manufacturing. There were, there was a car plant not too far away. And it's been replaced by jobs which are based on precarity and fear, essentially. I and mean, the biggest employer there was, when I arrived was in town was Amazon. And everyone, all me and all my co-workers, we had nine month contracts. So after nine months, you'd automatically lose your job anyway. And you can't build, you know, if you live in this town, you can't build a life on that. You can't get a mortgage. You can't raise a family when you know after so nine precarious. months. Yeah, you, I mean, if you, if you make it to nine months, if you're lucky, I mean, you'd, I took one day off sick and I was disciplined for it with this point system. And if you get six points, you lose your job. So if you take a week off, you've got five points, you're one, one point away from getting the sack. Um, and then even if you do, if you're good as gold, you, you, you lose your job after nine months pretty much anyway. And this is in you know, a formerly proud industrial town. And I think that experience is mirrored in the UK and Europe and in the US um, at the moment. Another thing in your book that really kind of, that I found let's say, particularly troubling, were these slogans that you said were all around the warehouse. And I've, I've written one down here. We love coming to work and miss it when we're not here. Yes, I mean, I had to do a kind of double take when I first saw that because it was kind of like this book is writing itself um, <laughs> with some of the things that were appearing. I mean, there's this euphemistic um, veil which is um, pulled over this world of, of precarity and low paid at the, at the lower end of the, the economy so uh, language is deployed to kind of obscure what's going the reality of your for example so yeah I mean there would be cardboard cutouts first of all appearing around the warehouse one of which said um, was a kind of speech caption saying we love coming to work and we miss it when we're not here and it was this woman supposedly called Bez saying this. Um, did, we were also, did your fellow workers buy into this? No, you just kind of saw it and I mean, you just kind of saw it and like, I don't know, you, it just made you super cynical, I suppose. Um, and But there was also, you know, when we arrived on the first day, we were told that we weren't supposed to call it a warehouse. We weren't allowed to call it a warehouse. We had to call it a f fulfillment centre. Um, we <laughs> weren't like a parody. <laughs> yeah, but then it's, it's slightly more sinister when we, we weren't allowed to call each other workers or employees either. We were all associates and Jeff, we were told Jeff Bezos is an associate as well, just like you. Um, it was kind of to blur the, blur the distinction between the fact that I would earn £26 in the morning, whereas Jeff About Bezos' stock $35. price has gone up by £3 billion or something. Um, similarly with Uber, you had um, all this stuff about being your own boss, flexibility, which kind of was an attempt to distort the reality of what was actually going on. Is it, is it possible to prosper and progress in, 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 in these sorts of conditions? No. Um, first of all, because you, there's, there's no stability. So, I mean, the difference between some of the older jobs that they've, that something like the warehouse has replaced in this community is that however dirty and dangerous it was to work in a coal mine, um, there was a sense of dignity that came with that in terms of you would, you would hold your head up high and say, I'm a collier. There was, um, there's work-based affiliational um, organisations, the trade union and solidarity. As, as one man in South Wales said to me, um, he said, uh, the, the factory in the coal mine, it was a, an extension of your family. Um, whereas you can't support a family when you're, you're on a contract that automatically terminates after nine months. You can't plan at all. Some people, some people argue that 
well, these people are choosing to work there. They're making a choice, but choice. No, I mean, choice, every choice happens within a social and economic context. And the, I mean, one of the things that was notice, noticeable at the Amazon warehouse where I worked is that um, most of my co-workers were from Eastern Europe, so poorer countries in Eastern Europe, Romania being the, the, the first example. In Romania, the average salary was around £100 a week. So around $150 right. a week. Yes, and whereas we earned around £250 a week, so... Around $400 a week. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, there's, I mean, as, as a Romanian guy I lived with said to me that, you know, well, yeah, we can go back to Romania and live poorly, you know, on the outskirts of the forest, but it's it's not really a choice, is it? I mean, you yeah. have to, you have you have bills to pay, you have to pay the rent. Um, you can choose. To, I mean, is it a choice to be poor? No, I mean, you have I mean, to get I, the job that's there. I did I did work early on in my career um, around sweatshop labour in Bangladesh. You know, and people would say, "Oh, the women are making a choice working there," and I I would argue as well. You know, you can't at the same argument. You can't look at choice without looking at the social environment and the economic context in which people are working. But you know, I'm interested, you know, you think a lot about politics and political implications. Mm -hmm. you know, do you have thoughts, I guess this is raising kind of a big question of who who does one vote for if you have no choice? And, and is this, are these the people who then are bound to, um, to be you know, to fall for populist politicians and and the Trumps of this world, you know. I'm just I'm just listening to to all you're saying, and I'm I'm thinking what a victory it is that your book is sold on Amazon. I mean, it's so interesting, and it's 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 really an amazing story. And 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 I'm as you said, Marina, I'm really interested in that in that intersection between, you know, where we're going, where we're heading with this, you know, people left behind by robotics and and globalization and. The abandonment of democracy. I was in Cole County, Pennsylvania, right? The the, the county that voted for Trump in huge numbers um, after uh, uh, um, after the elections. I wanted to see if they still support him. And it's really interesting what you said about the fact that the coal miners and they're they're making minimum wage as well, but they have that dignity of saying, "My father was a coal miner and his father before him," and they go down the mine and you go down with them, and then you see this huge thing written in chalk saying the slogan that says, you know, coal miners for Trump. And you're, you're wondering about that because it's, it's clear in every poll made in the United States, done in the United States and in this country, that people feel like if, they're, if democracy isn't working, if their children are not better off than they will be, then they kind of lose faith mm -hmm. in, in democracy. And, and if they have to, again, I agree completely, you don't have a choice. I to work in these places. I if think it's compounded. Um, sorry, sorry. To no. um, I think it's compounded in so working class pride, if you like, in some of these places. Um, when you've only got precarious jobs, so the biggest employers in this town I was working for Amazon were Amazon first of all, then a company called Tesco and Argos, and all the entry level jobs it was temporary work, minimum wage uh, work, um, and so. I mean, if you're growing up in that environment and you don't go away to university, it's compounded by the fact that just a few generations back, you had this this pride working class culture where, I mean, the the jobs in the in the in the commons were state commons were relatively well paid because yep. uh, you had mm -hmm. a strong trade union, um, but the fact that that's disappeared relatively rapidly, it leads to this sort of resentment against um, like market forces I suppose but because you can't see those forces you, you're looking for something tangible that to kind of cling on to and I think populist leaders come along yes. and and it's it's kind of they replace in the invisible power of the market right. with the with the visible power of either the the individual leader or the kind of the the pariah so the the migrant mm -hmm. or the the yeah. person on on job benefits welfare and when you're thinking about the future for example in the United States you're going to have there are three million people who, who work as drivers in five or ten years, these people are going to be out of a job. Who's thinking about that? Mm. Who's, you know, who's who's mm. helping these people? Mm. We're going to take a break now. When we come back, I'll be talking more to James Bloodworth about his time undercover in the low-income economy. <laughs> I've got lots of people putting their thumbs up. So well done, everybody. Um, it's been great so far. I think I'm like I'm I'm walking back because <laughs> I want people to see Sarah. Like, like, I don't know if um, to do this or this. Oh, good, they're putting well the aircon on for a bit. <coughs> really the moving and engaging. Yeah, program it's from all really. Of you. Yeah, thank you, thank you everyone. We're so so going yes. downhill now. <laughs> um, just how are we on time? Just so I can. Uh, we're good. Yeah. yeah.
That's the film and center thing. That's Orwell. I mean, that yeah. yeah, it was. God, that is weird. It's weird, yeah. I, I but started I bet off. It, but I bet that the person who decided to do that didn't think they were doing it in an Orwellian way. They probably just thought, this is going to be great. We'll really motivate people, you know. So I think the cut out. Yeah, the cut out, I think. But yeah. the language of around, yeah. I think even if they don't know what they're doing, they're trying to blur the distinction between mm. being a worker and a boss. And similarly yeah. with Uber, when they pump out all this language around uh, being your own boss and flexibility, it's it becomes kind of a, a, a cultish like mantra after a while, so they're mm. just kind of chanting this thing and it has no re mm. relation to reality. But, it, but you know, the, the, it the frightened me a bit, the, the whole the thing. The culture of language and it changes very rapidly and you know, there are lots of examples of it that were words that we used 10 years ago that are now no longer, longer PC at all, you can't use them. I mean, in my, in my world, in, in the mental health world, you know, you used to say patient, my patient who has depression or whatever, now you say client or service user. I mean, mm, that they is, did that in the they're the same people, well. they're yeah. unwell, they're, but it gives the, it, it's like, we you know, I find it as well, slightly customer. euphemistic, yeah, but it's like, that, you know, they, they aren't well, but then, and they're, they're a service user, but they wouldn't really want to use a service, I mean, no. ideally, <laughs> it's not like a choice, again, it's all about choice. I, I wonder if the security check was also to search for cameras, because... Yeah, because I couldn't take a, well, I could have, because it's, um, someone, was going to put a camera on me, but we didn't prepare enough. But you could get oh, right. a camera that's like hair, like right, a hair, or like basically. glasses right. or something. Yeah, yeah, I can go yeah they did say you're not allowed to wear your sunglasses because we need to see your eyes. Wow. In case you've had anything to drink the night before. Jeez. Oh, what? Yeah, I mean, it was. It kind of wrote itself once you'd mm. been in there for a bit. It was just like writing everything down in this notepad. There's a um, psychologist, neuroscientist, who tried to study. Uh, irritability and frustration. You know, what happens in the brain when you feel irrit irritated and frustrated? Because some people feel it to a pathological degree. So you, we try to simulate that in... in I can empathise with it's that. It's basically, <laughs> it's basically <laughs> like how you're describing that when you're talking about you can't be good. It's like that. Yeah. You give them a task, you go out of the scanner, out of the brain scanner, they can do. But when they're in the brain scanner, you make it just so hard that they never beat it. They can but never it, achieve it. Made, made me it made makes you behave worse. worse. Thirty seconds. So I yeah. ended up kind of I see something defiling the floor and I just leave it. I boot the spine of some mm. DVDs when I'm walking past them. Because like you're frustrated, exactly. And I have this glass. Yeah. It's a model of frustration. It's how you get people to feel frustrated. You do that. What a weird way to set up your yeah. workplace. To have lots of frustrated people. Turnover. That sounds great. Five seconds. Five seconds. Live from London, you're listening to Megahertz London Calling with your host, Norena Hertz, on Sirius XM Inside 121. Welcome back to Megahertz with me, Norena Hertz. I'm talking to James Bloodworth about his time undercover working in the low-income economy. James, so what's the what's the solution should should we should we stop using these companies should did you used to use Amazon yeah I mean I've, I've used Amazon and Uber in the past I think consumer boycotts are um, part of the I mean it, it's something that I think people who can afford to shop eth ethically should do right across the board I think it's I don't think we should lecture poorer people on where they can and cannot buy from but I think anyone who can afford to shop ethically should try and do that I think there's a bigger However, I think there's a bigger kind of battle um, in terms of either grassroots activism um, or changing law, the law to stop companies being able to exploit people so easily. And even just, in, I think, first of all, enforcing existing laws. So one of the things I, I experienced when I was working at Amazon was I was paid below the minimum wage um, for half the time I was working there. I interviewed a young woman who was paid 62 pence an hour a dollar um, an hour yes um and it took six weeks to claw the money back and that was only because her mother made threats to, to take the company to, to one of the regulators um it feels like there is no proper enforcement of many of the existing laws to start with um before we look at things like making it easier for trade and unions to organize in, that, in some of these that's places. what i was thinking you know in the old days when you had the coal mines you know one of the important roles that trade unions of course had at the time was you had these people who individually didn't have much voice who maybe would have been being screwed by the company, but they were able to help them collectively um, have better working conditions, um, have better pay. So is presumably part, part of the solution potentially would be more unionization. Yes, I mean, I think since the kind of 
like union, trade unions are often summoned still as, as kind of a demon by by some sections of the media, whereas um, unions are, are in kind of have been in kind of full blown retreat. Um, mm -hmm. I think in Britain and the United States mm -hmm. in in recent mm -hmm. decades, and in many of the the workplaces, well, in fact, all the workplaces I, since I went, there was there was no kind of trade union in sight. Um, partly because Britain has some of the strictest tra anti trade union laws um, in in Europe, um, and it's also because in in many of the industries that I worked in, you've got a very transitory um, workforce. Mm -hmm. So you have on the one hand you have um, uh, many many of those people in these workplaces were migrants, so um, they tend to not be staying around long enough to, to join a trade union. Um, and it's yeah, and, and and otherwise there are there are kind of things like uh, zero hours contracts, for example. Um, so so where you have no guaranteed, guaranteed hours. Of your yeah. hours. Um, Sarah Jane, what does it what's it do to your brain if you work in these sorts of conditions? Well, yeah, I mean, I was just thinking when you were describing um, the the setup at Amazon, what, the way you can never really achieve the goals they give you. You can never do things fast enough. It's almost set up in that respect. That in in neuroscience is how we um, how we model um, irritability and frustration. So if we want to know which parts of the brain are active when you feel incredibly frustrated and irritated. Um, we, we basically set up a game like that, a task like that, where we, we get participants in the scanner to do some task at w which they're told they can achieve and get points, but actually we rig it so they can't ever achieve it. And it feels incredibly frustrating because um, it feels like you're constantly almost there, but you, you never actually do it. And it's a model of, yeah, it's, it's, it's frustration and irritability in the brain. And I mean, uh, yeah, wow. and, and lots of wow. areas of the brain's emotional system wow. become actually. So the future, but <laughs> uh, what did Amazon do to my brain? Um, James <laughs> Bloodworth, thank you. Thank you. James's book, Hired, Six Months Undercover in Low Wage Britain, is on sale now. Israel. Israel is a country that's rarely out of the news. Despite the fact it's tiny, only eight and a half million people live there, which is roughly the same number of people who live in New York, it plays a disproportionate role on the global stage. Founded almost 70 years ago in the wake of the Holocaust, Israel is to this day the only democracy in the Middle East. Initially an agricultural state, today the nation punches above its weight when it comes to science, innovation and media. The USB flash drive, the apps, Waze and Viber and popular TV shows such as Homeland and Fox's recent talent show The Four were all born in Israel. Historically, the United States has been a major ally. But how is the new US administration viewed by Israelis? And how about the current Middle East security situation? How worried should we be? I'm delighted that Yannick Levy is with us today in the studio to help us figure this all out. For 15 years, Yunit has been the chief news anchor of Israel's main primetime news programme. She has reported on the ground during seminal events such as 9-11, the Japanese tsunami disaster and the wars in Gaza. And global movie viewed include President Barack Obama, groundbreaking anchor, President George W. Bush, President Bill Clinton and Tony Blair. Israelis are pretty obsessed with the news, aren't they? <laughs> I'd say obsessed is an understatement. Um, you know, Israelis, I think, can't agree with, with each other on anything, really. If I have to uh, explain Israel and how argumentative we all are, I used to say that if René Descartes was born in Israel, it wouldn't be, you know, I think, therefore, I am. It would be, I think, therefore, you're wrong. <laughs> so we love, you know, we love to argue we're a country that's so sort of subdivided into groups and of, of different ethnic and religious and political affiliations. And the one thing that sort of unites Israelis is actually watching the news. So the ratings are very high, the news are on primetime television, they're at 8 o'clock, um, and every given evening, four out of ten households are watching the news, which is wow. insane ratings. When we think about it in American terms, I think, you know, Lester Halt or David Muir, who anchor the evening news in the United States, would really kill for those numbers. Um, but I think it's more than that, it's indicative of the way that we, you know, Israelis feel in general under existential threats. So news is is a survival tool. So you watch it and you're cur and you're always sort of on and, and since we don't have a 24 hour news channel but all of our networks sort of morph into a 24 hour news channel if something happens. So yeah, I'd say it was a small word. Um, I want to come that. back to the existential threat, but can mm -hmm. we start with the US, the relationship with the US? Sure. 
So the US is arguably Israel's greatest supporter, is that fair to say? Yeah, I think yeah. I'm not even sure it's arguable. Has that always been the case? No, not at all. I mean, like in any relationship, and not only between <coughs> countries, I think it's it's important to remember the history and not take anything for granted. I mean, uh, the, the US and Israel didn't always have this kind of relationship. I mean, when Israel started out as more of a socialist country, and you alluded to that, um, then then it, it's, its sort of affiliation was more with the USSR and more with France that gave uh, Israel weapons in its, in its first uh, uh, years. But then, um, I think around, I would say after the Six-Day War, something, something of a turning point happened. And the United States started viewing Israel as this you know, beacon of democracy in a very troubled neighborhood and obviously a very loyal, loyal friend um, and a very good, let's say, client for many American uh, uh, products and also a place that supplies today, that supplies the United States with, with a lot of technological assistance and intelligence assistance. So that has changed and of course it, it has to do with certain I mean, we, we might get into this. Different leaders in the United yes. States and in, in Israel had different relationships, but I think because I'm, I'm interested in that, um, in that because you know, of course, the relationships will differ depending right. on who's in power in Israel and who's in power in the United States. And the relationship between Netanyahu and Barack Obama was fraught, wasn't it, by the <laughs> by the end of Obama's administration? Yeah. Trump different. Well, first of all, I mean, fraught. Um, I'm, I'm still waiting for that book to come out on the Netanyahu-Obama relationship. I mean, I'm waiting for the the full disclosure on both sides. It was definitely a very problematic relationship, and I would say, um, as sort of uh, going into the Trump-Netanyahu relationship, I would say that um, Obama and Netanyahu were very different in their worldview. I mean. Obama was the liberal who grew up in the 60s in Hawaii, and Netanyahu was, was the conservative uh, who, who grew up in embattled Jerusalem in the 50s, and one of them was, you know, Obama was the person who wanted to make the world better, and, and Netanyahu was the person who was afraid of how bad things could be. So they were very different in their worldview. Um, it is a different time now um, in many respects. Trump and Netanyahu, a lot of things they agree on. Um, I think they're very similar in a lot of their political attitudes, the way they sort of galvanize their base um, and the way that they attack the media, for example. But they're also very different. I think it would be, if, if Trump eventually brings back the ultimate deal for peace in the uh, uh, Middle East, which is a big if, uh, if he does, it will be much harder for Netanyahu to say no than it would have been, you know, under Obama. So. Kind of surprisingly, it might it might yet be that Trump actually delivers a solution. It's an interesting. Oh, first of all, I think everything. I don't know if it, I can generalize. It's about the Middle East, but definitely about Israel. It's a country of paradoxes. So the paradox is that you know, whereas the American left would want Trump to disappear, the Ameri the Israeli left is kind of waiting to see exactly on that point that you that you made. Maybe Trump is the one who could actually bring bring the deal. Um, which is again a very big if, but and that's I guess an interesting point. so maybe maybe he would be able to move that forward given his relationship with Netanyahu. But some people argue that he is potentially creating another threat, and this is around Iran. So we know that Iran's no friend of Israel. Its leadership has said that Israel should be wiped off the face of the earth. What's we know that Trump is considering tearing up the um, Iran nuclear deal and he's now got John Bolton as national security advisor who's obviously very hawkish and in recent months has advocated I think bombing of Iran. Um, is this good news? Is this perceived as good news in Are Israel to see or bad news? beginning to see why <laughs> I began this program de declaring I'm never giving up chocolate, right? Because it's just like, <laughs> this is the only way to deal with the situation in the Middle East. Well, I mean, it's, it's a very good question, what will happen with the Iran deal? Um, and uh, I would say this, it's it, again, a sort of paradox. The defense circles in Israel would say two things. They would say it's not a good enough deal or it's even a bad deal, but any deal is better than no deal. Um, and so the, so the military establishment supports the deal? It, it supports it in, a, in, in that sense, in saying that it's better than controlling or restraining Iran in a sense is better than not restraining it at all. But I think a lot of people, again, also in the defense circles, would say maybe this is an opportunity to fix the deal in the sense that, first of all, it gives you more time because the, one of the problems of the deal is when it expires, Iran can do whatever it wants. And it gives some sort of restraint on Iran's missile program in general, which is not in the deal right now at all. 
And um, um, let's discuss the fact that Iran is, you know, entrenched in southern Syria, which is something that is bothering Israel deeply these days. So, so many people think that maybe the fact that Trump is being hardline and threatening to, he can't really tear up the deal because there are other countries that are signed, but, but to withdraw from it um, might change Iran's mind. But again, what if it doesn't? And what if we're going to a confrontation, even if it's on the Syrian border between Israel and Iran? Uh, so there are a lot of questions here, and I think the biggest question is, what does the Trump administration want? What is What are the long-term policies? Are there long-term policies at all? Um, and, and so unless until we figure that out, I think it's very hard to know wh where this is going. Because the security situation right now in Israel feels you know, particularly dangerous. Am I right? Because it feels that uh, alongside m almost all your borders, there are, there are danger zones. Yes, I mean, it's not, uh, when you talk about Iran and the prospect of a nuclear Iran, which is a, a, a big problem, but again, it's not on your border. And like you say, the fact that you have uh, Iranian uh, pr presence in southern Syria, that's Israel's northern border, and you have Hezbollah, the Iranian proxy, on Lebanon, and you have Hamas in the southern part of Israel. And then you have and ISIS in And you have ISIS in, in Egypt, Egypt. And you have maybe someone who one day wants and has an appetite to open all of these fronts at the same time. Um, so I think that it's, it's that existential threat that we were talking about at the beginning of our conversation is, is something that sort of seeps into um, the Israeli mindset and also explains why Benjamin Netanyahu has been pri prime minister for 10 years. I mean, because Israelis, I mean, if you ask yourself, what do Americans vote about? And we talked about when something we alluded to when, when James was speaking. They, they vote on the economy. Right. And if the economy it will be good in 2020, then Trump will be reelected, period. And if, and Israelis vote on security. And if, if they feel relatively secure, they're going to continue to vote for the person who's, who's in charge. And how, how, besides voting, does living under such existential threat affects one's day-to-day -day life, or are you just <laughs> so... Sarah, what does it do to your brain? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what does it do to your brain? Does it do something to your brain if you're just constantly stressed I'll that your country might be attacked? I'll add in the, there's this happiness thing, uh, index that they do yes. at Columbia University, I think, and they always, Israel comes up really high, it's like in the 11th place. By the way, Britain is 22, <laughs> right, 22nd place. And it's always this amazing thing. You're, you're talking about these existential threats, and how come we're happy? We're like a happy nation, uh, at least according to this index. And my answer is that either we're very good at denial, um, or that we um, that living on a vol volcano does have its perks in the sense that you you kind of live life to the fullest. You say, okay, well maybe tomorrow, you know. But again, I think that this existential threat, and you've, you've, we talked about this when we talked about the teenage brain, the existential threat is not solely Israel's um, sentiment anymore. I mean, I think many countries in the West, including yes. Britain, including the US, feel like yes. that has changed. And of course, it's different circumstances in a, co in a complex situation, but that feeling of, of terror, of things that can blow up any minute, that you can sit in a restaurant and and not sure that you, you not be secure that you're returning home is something that we all kind of share. And it's, it's amazing how quickly you actually become immune to yeah. it here. I mean, we had a spate here in London of attack after attack after attack. And it, it was so quickly, it was like, oh yeah, there's been an attack. You didn't have a strong emotional response to it. So, yeah. No, I mean, it, it becomes a kind of another thing that you factor in when you go somewhere, you start to, I mean, there's a, a, an ex at an extreme end, you look start to look at other people suspiciously. But but I mean, more commonly, you're you're kind of if you see the kind of the backpack on the floor left in the restaurant or on the train or something, you start to think about it. Whereas, yes. you know, a few decades ago, actually, that's not quite true here because we had the threat from from Northern Ireland. But it it feels kind of it, it's another kind of thing to 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 kind of another uh, another bit of fear that kind of creeps into you, which might not have been there previously. But you do get used to it, you sensitise to it, because you, you can't live in a heightened state of adrenaline, fear. But it's like a low level thing, isn't it, where it's just one, it's just kind of something that's kind of gnaws away a little bit when you're, if you're in a particularly busy spot and, yeah, yeah. You, you see that kind of I think it becomes abandoned more, backpack. Do you something. think it becomes more kind of cognitive, though? You, you don't feel this intense fear, acute fear. No. You feel more... Okay, it's like problem solving. Okay, I'm in a, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm walking along a, a busy road in London. What I better would watch be my out next for move massive be trucks. If this happens. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Rather than I'm actually scared. 
I don't think you can feel like that for no, very long. No, that, I think that's right. You know, you're a kind of world-class journalist. You've already interviewed three US presidents. If you were to interview Donald Trump, <laughs> what, what's your burning? What would what's your burning question? Oh wow! I don't. I I I, uh, <laughs> I hope we we get to that point. It's been uh, difficult to try and arrange this. I think um, uh, President Obama made it his a point of trying to talk directly to the Israeli people because he had such a hard time with, with the Israeli leadership. I don't know to say to what extent it, it, it helped him, but he really did try. I think that President Trump does feel that like, he has uh, the sympathy of the Israeli uh, public right now. I mean, the Israelis kind of feel like he sees the reality like they do. So I don't know if he'll make a very big effort at trying to give an interview. Yuni, thank you so much. And thanks again to my other guests, James Bloodworth and Sarah Jane Blakemore, from the neural pathways of the teenage brain to the maze of Amazon's warehouses to the corridors of Israeli power. It's been quite a journey. Join me on Megahertz next month for another expedition across the peaks of science, culture and politics. For now, it's goodbye from London. Goodbye.